Thank you. Um, good morning and uh, good noon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this um, today. Uh, I have been working with a lot of you, and it's nice to see you face to face. Um, we are very grateful for the inputs of our experts that are here with us. Dr. Nina was uh, constant in our meetings and in advising our principals as well as the vaccine cluster on what decisions to be made. Also, Dr. Alandria was part of our technical advisory group. Dr. Lulu Bravo and Dr. Lobo was also our NAFIC point persons, and they really um, enhance our uh, roll out when it comes to addressing AFIs. And not only that, no, I also see a lot of our implementers on the ground. Dr. J. Lo is one of our point persons in the gig. And uh, the Lakeshore vaccination site is our model vaccination site for the implementation. We started with a roll out um, uh, doing some simul simulation runs no, in Lakeshore to make sure that our processes are uh, appropriate and we can deliver the operations timely and also uh, safely no, to our, our constituents. And also, Sir Brian, when we work on the pharmacies, when we started working on the pharmacies, they were also a part of in our implementation. We launched a um, program to ensure that uh, our pharmacies will be part of the vaccination team no? because before, hindi sila qualified to do vaccinations to the effort of uh, all of us. And I know even if I don't mention your names, uh, uh, my presentation will just be a look back on how we have experienced our COVID-19 vaccination. I believe one way or another, you have been part of the implementation. So my presentation is on the lessons learned, the challenges on the COVID-19 vaccination rollout. In behalf of Undersecretary Mir Nakabutai, supposedly she will be the one to discuss with you. I will be sharing our experiences with our vaccination rollout. So we started with our vaccination rollout with the directives of President Trua Duterte at that time, around September 2020, when he said, um, it is very important to roll out a safe, effective, and free vaccines for all P Filipinos who are eligible for vaccination. With that directive, it became a direction for all of our agencies to either provide resources, funding, which was really important, uh, bylaws um, or uh, policies and plans to uh, support the implementation and also to ensure that the local government units are really implementing the program. The direction at that time was really to use a whole of society approach. Based on the history of the Philippines, we never had a vaccination this big. The biggest that we ever rolled out was the administration of 20 million doses uh, with a span of two months, no, around 1990s and 2000s. I was not <laughs> yet in DOH, they just give me some feedback. And with the direction to vaccinate um, at least 70 million of the eligible population at the start of the campaign, that was the uh, biggest. And we know um, we need a lot of resources and we need a lot of inputs by every stakeholder we can tap for the implementation to be really effective. It was quite frightful to be in the... Uh, to be in the position to think that uh, will this be successful or not, but then Taking, considering that the pandemic was really on its height at that time, there was no option but really to plan well for the vaccination. So according to the World Health Organization, the Philippines was uh, the first country to undergo an evaluation of its implementation last March 2022. Uh, we call this the the what's this COVID-19 program implementation evaluation or what we call CPI and the World Health Organization conducted this evaluation and concluded the following that the strengths of the Philippines in each implementation are first strong political commitment and leadership which was seen on the top level decision makers not only from the president uh, himself, but also to our agencies. All of the agencies, government agencies, were really um, 
uh, really help no, in ensuring that uh, leadership and commitment is being shown for the conduct of the vaccination. Not only that, the leadership of the local government units were really helpful in the rollout of the vaccination. Next was uh, the well-established structure for COVID-19 vaccination. Later, I will elaborate on that. And next is the successful collaboration and coordination between stakeholders. So the collaboration was not only among health professionals, the health sector, but also collaboration with other agencies not even related to health, collaboration with the local government units, and collaboration with the public sector, private sector. Next, we have consistent adherence to policies, strategies, and guidelines at all levels. So we see how our local government units and our stakeholders were implementing and following our guidelines, taking also into consideration um, later implications no, in the rollout. Next, we also have mobilization of funds and human resources and commitment to secure vaccines for the country. So the country was able to make some tripartite agreements and to ensure that the country has sufficient vaccines. So we have loans and also funding um, uh, gathered for us to ensure that we can purchase the vaccines needed. Our human resources also was mobilized all throughout the country. On a regular basis, we are deploying around uh, 5,000 vaccinators in a day on the um, height of the vaccination rollout on average, but during our national vaccination days, usually it reached around 11,000 vaccinators deployed across the country. And all of the resources or the human resources available, no? Kung sino man yung pwede, even the medical interns, the nurse interns were part of the rollout. And also the commitment to secure vaccines at the start of the vaccination, and the negotiation, it was really hard because as a middle-income country, we do not have uh, enough cloud to move the negotiations forward. And we were also thankful for the vaccine expert panel for giving the guidance no, on how our principals should negotiate on what vaccines to procure and what uh, vaccines to um, allow entry to the country. Next also, we have highly innovative and tailored strategies to reach all segments of the population. As a country with diverse um, geographical uh, definitions and descriptions, no, it, was, it is very important to be innovative and to tailor fit strategies because what will work in Manila will not work in Barm. And next is the strict adherence to national guidelines on vaccine delivery and safety. And the last is nimble and cross-chain workforce that re can respond to the changing needs. So we are really proud of our vaccination teams on the ground and our healthcare workers on the ground and our barangay healthcare workers. One advantage that we had also is that since 2018, we had a lot of outbreaks. So with that, we also had a lot of vaccination campaigns. Because of our vaccination, previous experiences in the vaccination campaigns, it also allowed us to adapt what worked before and uh, apply it no, on the COVID-19 uh, vaccination if it will work or not. And it really helped us a lot. Even in the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic in 2022, around the latter part of 20, no, 2020, we were rolling out the Sabayang Pata Contra Polio uh, to eliminate <laughs> polio during the pandemic. And also the measles rubella and oral polio vaccination, um, uh, supplemental immunization activity during the pandemic. So we were assured that our workforce is very knowledgeable on how to manage and to do their task even uh, uh, during the pandemic. No? So they have contextualized their uh, procedures well with the consideration of the minimal public health standards uh, for COVID-19. So one of the um, strengths, as mentioned, 
um, by our colleagues is that the Philippines has created a well-represented organizational structure that enable national and local government units, our vaccine experts, our societies, our academe, our civil organizations, and private sector, among others, to participate. We didn't limit the capacities of what's a structure within the confines of the health sector, but we make sure that all voices can be heard in our implementation. So it was important that we have the vaccine uh, evaluation and selection group to do the selection and to evaluate vaccines, what vaccines will enter the country. We also have a team that focuses on, focus on diplomatic and negotiations and um, uh, neg uh, diplomatic relations with other countries. Uh, this was led by DFA and also um, Department of Finance. So even if they were not a part of the health sector, re they really provided the assistance in ensuring that we have enough vaccines in the country and we can, we can negotiate and compete with other countries when it comes to receiving vaccines. We also have our a uh, team focused on procurement and finance. We also have a team that focused on vaccine cold chain and logistics management that were participated not only by the health sector but also by the private sector. And we have one team that focuses on the vaccine administration and another team that was uh, focusing on demand generation and communication. Within this structure, we also have our external experts that provided counsel and expertise on the decision making. We have the NITAG, we have the Vaccine Expert Panel, we have the HTAC, and also the NAFIC and the RAFIX in the regional level. To complement the national structure, we also have the operations arm to make sure that on a day-to-day -day basis, since vaccination is really a synchronized effort between among uh, logistics, operations, manpower, and also demand generation. To ensure that all these three components are working, we have the National Vaccination Operations Center, supported by our regional counterparts, and with the strength of the local government units, they also have their own structure to ensure that day-to-day -day operations are being looked after and that implementation are going on. Another strength that we have is the presence of plans and policies which provided clear guidance and enabled decision makers and implementers at all levels to standardize implementation. One thing that was difficult was that um, uh, the direction was really to make policies and plans reach the implementers as fast as possible and as timely as possible because the facts and the science about COVID-19 vaccines are evolving also really fast. So if our implementers cannot catch up with the um, new guidelines and technical guidance, it would be very hard for the implementation. So we put mechanisms and structures to make sure that all of the policies and plans are cascaded swiftly and timely. So we have policies that are providing clear strategic structure and strategic directions. We have policies like the NDVP who provided the operational plan and of course all our technical and operational guidelines that are cascaded on a regular basis, sometimes every week. <laughs> <laughs> Nasa stress sila kasi every week training na naman. <laughs> and of course, um, there are so also changes no on the tactical operations that must be cascaded down to the down down the line. Some are just questions on the operations, but it was very important for us to really address them because any confusion on the ground will really have an impact on the operations. This was also uh, lessons learned we have with our interactions with. Uh, Israel, in which they say uh, having a, just a one half page or a one page direction on what must be done and to adapt to the new changes in directions is also very important. That serves us our tactical directions to the local government units. So for our challenges, we have, I will mention five. I know there's a lot. <laughs> Because to be honest, uh, the implementation in the Philippines, I believe, was, if you compare it with others, if you hear stories about the implementation of other countries, uh, ours was really complicated and complex. So 
The challenge, the first challenge was the lingering trauma caused by the Deng Vaksha controversy. First was uh, the hesitancy of the decision makers and health professionals. Not only was it evident in the implementers in the local government units, in our health units, but also in the national level. Even on the national level, very few was willing to take on the task to really work on the COVID-19 vaccination when we were starting to explore the possibility of a vaccination campaign. Thankfully, we had one strong woman who was willing to take the lead. This was under Secretary Mir Nakabutahe. And her wisdom really put um, much uh, value no, on our implementation. I don't think that the COVID-19 vaccination program would have worked without her guidance. Next, um, it causes excessive cautiousness in our implementation. No? Yeah, causing hesitancy to streamline processes. The very example on the BP taking. Uh, we, uh, as we were starting a rollout, it was really a comprehensive step-by-step -step process. But then later on, when we tried to adopt, now we, we recognized that we can streamline some processes. Some um, local government units, ayaw talaga. Now they do not want to change. So even around uh, February 2022, uh, I was still talking to um, health, uh, a city health officer in which he said, na, no, it's very important. <laughs> na, we should take BP, even though guidance is already provided now by the DOH and our society that um, um, uh, taking the BP is an optional uh, procedure in the vaccination process. Vaccine hesitancy among health and other professionals, it was very ev evident in our uh, education professionals, no? our teachers, um, when they uh, hear vaccines and vaccination uh, due to the history of the vaccine all of a sudden they would not have themselves vaccinated and this would also influence the decision making of mothers um, to have their children vaccinated. However, there are also positive things that the Dimvaksh controversy has brought upon the implementation. First is that um, at this round we made sure that an organizational structure was in place and there was a clear chain of command which was lacking in the Dengvaksha time. Next, we also standardized the vaccination process across the country. There was no shortcut. Nobody is required to have shortcuts, and the form should be uniform at all levels. Um, there shouldn't be handwriting on piece of papers for consents and such. So, and there was also strict implementation of consent and assent forms, making sure that these documents are available so that we will not go back to the Dengvaksha I know that we are looking for where were the consents of the parents during the vaccination. Next is uh, we also conducted regular uh, supportive supervision and monitoring mechanisms to ensure that uh, vaccination sites are implementing the process appropriately. And if not, um, their innovations and their uh, changes is still applicable within the standards of safety. Next, also, we were able to implement a centralized data reporting, even though this is quite um, 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 not well-functioning, but somehow we were able to gather a centralized data in which we can see the data uh, for e every vaccine. Next is the complexities of the global vaccine demand and supply. As of December 2022, 80% of the global supply was already reserved for rich countries, and so we were part of the 20%. A lot of the countries has already reserved the vaccine supply, and as a country, it was very difficult to know what are the possible vaccines we can have for 2021. So therefore, the planning for how to roll out the vaccination was very difficult as well, because uh, we do not have clear scenarios and clear uh, vaccines that will be implemented. So when we did our scenario making, like we come up with at least 20 scenarios on all the possible vaccines that we were currently negotiating. And ev every few days and uh, after every negotiation, there would be some changes. And of course, you change again the plan. So it was very difficult to plan. The uh, vaccine demand and supply for COVID-19 vaccine is also quite different for 
um, or regular vaccines. No? Um, when we roll out our regular vaccines, we know that sufficient vaccines are already available in our health centers and even in our inventory uh, at our central level. With the implementation of COVID-19 vaccines, we were not even, we do not know no, how many vaccines we will be receiving in the next week, in the next, next week, in the next month, no? because uh, we were just trying to live by uh, what we will receive. So we started our implementation on March 2021. At that time, we have very high demand but very few vaccines. Thus, it was very difficult. The contingencies wa were to put detailed prioritizations. However, the, de uh, the overcomplexity of the prioritization caused so much confusion on the implementation on the ground. So like, for example, what is the category of a embalmer? <laughs> so it was really confusing, really, really confusing to implement. And, uh, it really eat out our operations no answering questions on if this category of employment is considered as A1 or not, or if not, they just A4. It was very uh, confusing at the time. Recommend that if ever we have a vaccination program such as this uh, big, we will have a more streamlined prioritization for easier implementation. And of course, uh, at the start, because we have very few vaccines available, we started with our vaccination rollout with the donations no, of China, China, with Sinovac. And we were very reliant on the donations from COVAX facilities. No? So they provided us uh, the first batches of AstraZeneca and also uh, Pfizer. We were also very dependent with other countries because uh, the donation of other countries uh, arrived earlier than those that were negotiated. However, this also caused uh, an imbalance in, uh, in our demand and supply no? because uh, we were also negotiating uh, enough for the population, but we were also welcoming donations because we do not know if the negotiations will push through or not. So that's why uh, supplies bloated uh, beyond what we expected to receive because we accommodated the donations to ensure that if our negotiations will not push through, then we will have enough supply to cover the population, uh, eligible population. So with that, um, we also accommodated no, because of the uneasiness of our LGUs and private sector. This was also, they were also allowed to procure. They, this all also complicated the implementation further. So the result was there was very high competition for vaccines among stakeholders, not only among local government units, but also among political partners. Um, friends, private sectors, and everything. It was really hard to manage and to make sure that the prioritization is being followed at all costs for us to implement properly. There was also intense clamor and an ease among constituents. We hear stories of stampede at, as early as 4 p.m. in San, Nayon, San Lazaro Mall. Oh. Those things were... Um, uh, evident at the time, and our vaccination sites were flooded. So most of the time, we have very little vaccines, but a lot of people are cl clamoring to be vaccinated. And this re also resulted for of um, constituents lying, no? A4, A1 ako, A3 ako, kahit hindi pa sila A1 at A4. Um, we only have uh, experienced equality, some form of equality around November to December. When most of our vaccines arrived and the demand was also high, so we uh, took the opportunity to conduct a national vaccination days during this time. So we conducted two NVTs at this time period. However, later part, on the 2022, early 2022, we see a lowering of the demand and also very high um, supply. So at this time, we tried to use as many or contextualized implementation as as varied as we can be to make sure that we can reach the population, the remaining population that we want to vaccinate, even though we already have vaccinated quite a lot. 
We also assisted the LGUs in the private sector in redistributing their vaccines because uh, they received their vaccines. However, they were already able to fully vaccinate most of their pop population, especially in Metro Manila. However, this resulted uh, due to the fact that um, these deliveries were caused by the procurement of uh, the private sector and the LGUs. Since they are the least priority in the delivery, their vaccines arrive later as well. And when their vaccines arrived, most of, the cons of their constituents were already vaccinated. And we cannot forgo the fact that as the vaccination program continued, there was increasing vaccine hesitancy and some le level of population complacency as the COVID-19 pandemic also eased up and allowed us to be more mobile without restrictions. Another challenge is on the geography and our vaccine portfolio and the varied temperature storage requirements and the storage capacity implication of cold chain. To give a background, our country was one of the countries with uh, the most diverse vaccine portfolio. As mentioned, we have nine vaccine brands and we range uh, our temperature requirements from uh, plus two to plus eight to as low as uh, our ultra low freezers. It was hard to memorize. I know our implementers had a hard time. <laughs> what is the procedure for Gamalea versus Pfizer? Would you twirl? Uh, it's a, they are different methods on how to prepare the vaccines or you you just uh, what's the term for this in Pfizer you flip oh. tapos moderna diba swirl oh, yeah. it's very confusing another thing also is the Philippines of, is composed of a lot of islands with a variety of metropolitan areas and a lot also of Gida areas uh, we were talking with the Israeli team and what was unique was that um, their delivery system and their strategy was uniform at all, at all levels. No? At one time, at one time they can uh, reach the most distant um, area in less than four days. So very fast implementation and their implementation across the board is uniform. And that is not true with the Philippines because in the metropolitan area, you can deploy an ultra low temperature vaccine. But while in BARM, you have to take consideration how the health workers will transport the vaccines to the most distant communities. To address this concern, um, the national government and the LGUs have uh, done a lot of um, and implemented a lot of strategies. First is we consulted with other countries, as mentioned, Israel. We invested also in the procurement of cold chain storage equipment, especially the ultra-low freezers, supplemented by the capacities of the local government units. It was also very important to have a structured command structure for the cold chain management we, to ensure that we can prioritize fast-moving areas. We prioritize the NCR plus eight, considering that they have higher populations and also considering the prioritization framework. We also have uh, the establishment of the vaccine security team. This is the first um, in the implementation of any vaccine program to ensure that we can trace vaccine vials at all. We also tap the private sector and cold chain facilities to help us in the delivery of vaccines. We utilize the uh, assets of the armed forces of the Philippines and the Philippine National Police. We tried to roll out a flexible delivery system that was unique in each uh, ge geographical locations and we deploy uh, varied deployment strategies, whether it be one-time delivery, the use of hubs and spokes, a direct delivery, among others. We also contextualize distribution based on the cold chain requirements. Gamalea and Pfizer were utilized in urban and fixed point vaccination sites. Sinovac, Sinopharm, Janssen were utilized for house to house and remote areas. We tried to establish a mon monitoring and data management system to daily track our inventories and monitoring. And we have daily hand holding sessions between the national operation centers in the local government units to ensure that operations are going well in the implementation. Before I move, can we 
play, I would like to show you a video, short video of how the Philippines deploy the vaccines and, uh, and our cold chain management.
let me go back to my slides for um, I have a few slides <laughs> so please bear with me I, I believe I'm over past the time <laughs> can we go back to the slide so we I'll, I'll share with you two more challenges and then um, or uh, last recommendations So the next challenge is our with our vaccine rollout. With our vaccine rollout, there's a lot of complications and um, elements that are moving that must be considered with what strategy to implement in a vaccination rollout. So each of these are contextualized. Can I have my slides, please? 12? Okay. So um, the factors are a lot, no? But then the vaccine, vaccination strategy must be first flexible and agile. It must be contextualized and localized. It must be thoroughly planned. And it must also be fast yet equitable. And we encourage a lot of innovation to ensure we can catch up with the implementation. So with this, we guided our implement implementers on what to implement. We utilize a lot and almost everything that we can think of for us to roll out any vaccination in any site in whatever strategy. For our best practices, we are very thankful for the enabling policies and protocols. The president was really helpful in providing presidential declarations. Other agencies were giving us the support that we need by releasing their policies and to ensure that all of their employments in all of the sectors under them are capable of reaching to the vaccination sites without any impending barrier. We also conducted the National Vaccination Days and Special Vaccination Days, and this was one of the most um, effective strategy that we have implemented at the time. So at this period, around two to three days, we, um, we, the country will really focus on the implementation and not more on any other endeavors. And with the help of all the sectors and other participants in other stakeholders, Holders, we conduct the National Vaccination Days. And with that, we also were supported with the whole of the society and the Bayanihan spirit that was ongoing at the time. We also have enabling environments and conditions. Local governments provided free transportation incentives, among others. We innovate strategies. We have, for the first time, vaccination sites, drive throughs bus vaccinations, pharmacies, food establishment, workplaces, and etc. We also conducted a special campaign within the campaign, the Totok A2 for our senior citizens, and within the concept of Pamilyang Protectado, Bakuna, protectado to ensure that all of the family members are vaccinated we also utilize and increase our capacity on our human resource by tapping all the health other health related pro uh, professionals DepEd and shed was really helpful in ensuring that we can top their workforces so we also did everything to bring vaccine closer to homes and workplaces in whatever conditions that is. And we also contextualize implementation to make it applicable to the eligible population. Um, Next, the last is a delay in the development of a unified information system. I know you're clamoring for your VAC cert and everything, everything. That is brought about a lot of complications in our information system nationwide. First, we do not have a nationwide ID system that would be, have been easier for us to record uh, and to track uh, constituents and um, Filipinos across the country. Our internet connections is really poor in rural areas. Um, some of the health units are still using conventional methods in reporting pen and paper. Then they transfer to computer or whatever is accessible to them. The system is quite complex. It's hard to maneuver. Uh, training was also difficult and we have a lot of uh, manpower requirements required in which the local governments were also trying to resolve the issues related to the information system. Um, the DICT rolled out a uh, hasten deployment of a lot of systems. However, there is a need to unify this and make it inter, uh, interoperable. 
So they deployed a lot of the systems. As you can see, that each of the types of requirements, they have their own system. And sometimes these uh, systems are not connected to one another. And therefore, sometimes we cannot use the data to analyze. So to end, the Philippines reached its in initial vaccination target under the Duterte administration. As of June 29, the last day of the Duterte administration, the country received around 245 million vaccines and administered 154.8 million doses and fully vaccinated 70.5 million individuals across the country. To commemorate, it is very timely for me speaking now because on December 1, the Philippines administered the highest recorded number of jobs in the country in a single day. And it is the fourth highest number of jobs globally. So at the time last year, today, <laughs> during the Bayanihan Bakunahan, which is the NVD part one, we vaccinated 2.8 million in one single day. On that time, we had an average of around 750,000 to 1.5 million uh, individuals vaccinated in a single day. When we endorsed the national vaccination program to the next administration, these were a recommendation. First is really to streamline the implementation of the COVID-19 vaccination with the national immunization program and to make sure that it is institutionalized as part of the regular services in health units or else we will be doing small campaigns but having low turnout but uh, would require excessive use of resources. Next is to address key research, policy, safety, and regulatory issues, and that will optimize vaccination impact. Next is we need to strengthen supply chain and management, even though we were able to roll out the vaccination and deploy the vaccines for our vaccination program. There is still a need to make sure that we use technology across the board for the cold chain management to ensure forecasting and inventory. Next is to improve vaccine confidence and empower communities as we see now rising vaccine hesitancy. And next to elaborate that the, the strategies that we have implemented under the COVID-19 pandemic response and the national COVID-19 vaccination deployment and vaccination program is encapsulated in the framework of universal healthcare. So um, if you want to read the full write-up on how the Philippines implemented the uh, National Deployment and Vaccination Plan for COVID-19. There is a document available. This was released just June 2022. So now the Department of Health continues to roll out the COVID-19 vaccination program under the leadership of President Marcos. Before the tagline was res bakuna kasangga ng bida. Now we have shifted our campaign sa booster pinas lakas. As we slowly transition, we have a lot of concerns and uh, challenges to face, including the booster administration and the children vaccination, as has been previously mentioned. These populations and these doses are required to ensure that we can protect our populations. There are a lot of challenges, such as complacency because of the pandemic situation, hesitancy, especially on the thought that uh, people are getting expired vaccines. That's the most common reason why people are not getting vaccinated. And we also have competing tasks already among healthcare workers. Now they are not only focused on COVID-19 vaccination, but they are also asked to do a lot of their routine tasks that they have left behind because of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, with all those concerns, it is my earnest hope that the lessons we have learned in the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination can be maximized in the implementation of other vaccination programs. With this, I hope that our collaborative efforts will not be forgotten and this will be implemented and contextualized in the forthcoming vaccination programs. Thank you.